Hi, I'm Greg Roth from uh, Penn State, the Department of Plant Science, and I'm with my colleague Elizabeth Dick from Ogren, the Organic Growers Res Research. Research and Information Sharing Network. It's a tough one. Just say Ogren. <laughs> okay. And we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the uh, small grains trials we've been doing on heritage and value added uh, uh, grains. And we're going to start a little bit with our wheat project here. And uh, I was wondering, Elizabeth, if you could tell us a little bit about what's happening with uh, value-added grains in the Northeast and their potential. Oh, yeah. And that's, that's for once, a happy, a happy story for somebody who's trying to introduce something new. And that is that the consumers are really after locally grown food. And they kind of started out with vegetables and dairy and uh, meat. And uh, in the last seven uh, to 10 years, consumers more and more asking, well, why can't we have locally grown grains? And our project has everything to do with trying to meet that demand, which continues to grow. So one, of, one of my experiences in the project has been trying to grow organic uh, grains. It's been a new venture for me over the last three years. And one thing I found is that the winter grains especially are not that hard to grow. And uh, what we've done in our trials here is basically plant uh, in October in a tilled seed bed following uh, uh, a clover a grass crop. And then, uh, and then we fertilize with uh, poultry man uh, some poultry manure and, uh, and harvest in the spring. And uh, many of the uh, varieties have been pretty competitive with uh, weeds and weed control for our winter grains has not been that big of an issue. Planting date is going to vary across our region, but uh, make sure you consult with somebody like Greg or, or uh, your extension agent because timely planting is important. You don't want to plant it too early. You can get some disease problems, but if, the later, if you go too late, you're going to have trouble with winter survivability and reduced yield. Yeah, and we, like other wheat, we've been planting about uh, 120, 150 pounds per acre at about an inch to an inch and quarter deep. and. Uh, had, have had great success. Normally in Pennsylvania we grow soft red winter wheat, but uh, this new uh, demand has opened the market for some other classes. Elizabeth, would you like to tell us a little bit about some of the wheats that we have in the trial here? There is high demand uh, by a uh, growing number of millers and bakers for baking quality, for bread making quality wheat. And usually when we think of bread making quality wheat, we think about the hard wheats. So we have some examples of uh, hard red winter wheat. Here we have a very famous um, wheat, the Heritage Red Fife, which you'll learn a little bit more about growing in the field, but you can see that it has uh, very dark red kernels. They're quite hard. You contrast that to the soft wheat, which is a lot uh, lighter. It's a more typical wheat. Right, and this, this is, as Greg said, is the, is the type that we've, for the last hundred years or so, this is, we've mostly grown soft soft uh, red wheat, but uh, Greg and others have been showing, as he's been saying, that we can grow the hard the hard reds. Here's another type of uh, hard red winter wheat. This is warthog, a modern variety. You can again see its deep red color. Um, these wheats will have fairly high protein contents. Red Fife will have quite high protein, 12 or more percent, um, uh, which also makes it very good for baking. So the soft, you've, you've seen the, the soft red wheat. This is uh, lovely wheat but it's used it has a lower protein content and so it's used more for pastries uh, cereals um, not so much for bread making and then here we have a very interesting class of wheat this is a, a hard white winter wheat this happens to be appalachian white but you can see it has a whiter color to its uh, kernel and uh, it's got uh, fairly decent protein it's a hard wheat and so that's also something that we can grow in this region. Elizabeth, let's go look at some of the uh, varieties we have in the field. Absolutely, because you have a beautiful display of winter wheat that's just about ready to combine. Okay, well, let's start out with one right in front of us, Pride of Genesee. This is actually a New York State heritage wheat. It was bred by uh, A.N. Jones in 1893 uh, near Rochester, New York. And it's a lovely wheat, it's, um, it, and it shows you several characteristics of heritage wheat. First of all, heritage wheat is considerably taller than modern wheat. You can see the, the difference between a modern variety here and the uh, heritage variety. 
And the reason that I like Pride of Genesee so much, although it's not going to yield as well as a modern wheat, it may yield 20 to even 33% lower than a modern wheat. When you talk about differences between heritage and modern wheats, there are some differing characteristics. Uh, for example, the height difference that I just talked about is pretty constant between heritage and modern wheats. But in terms of quality, you can't make those assumptions. And one of the great things about our project is that in, in addition to the great agronomic data we've been collecting, you've been collecting and your colleagues, we've also been doing some quality analysis. And so, for example, Pride of Genesee has very high test weight compared to modern varieties, say around 40, 50 varieties, it's ranking number three. Pride of Genesee is categorized as a soft white wheat. We talked about that previously. What you get perhaps in some of these heritage grains, in addition to the cachet, uh, folks like to buy heritage heirloom varieties. They, they, they like that. Um, you also can have some excellent quality characteristics, but you have to keep in mind that you will have more lodging. That is um, the, the grain, because it's taller, has a tendency to fall over more readily. And also you will have usually, not always, a yield deficit. Now here I see a more modern wheat. Yes, this is a, a love, this is a nice modern variety. And, and unfortunately the public has right now a very negative view of modern wheat with all this gluten business going on. And I wanna emphasize that there are wonderful modern varieties as well as heritage varieties. And one of the great things about your trial is that you're comparing them side by side. And so again, this is Arapaho. This was um, bred by the University of Nebraska. It's a very sturdy cultivar. You can see it's, it's, a, it's a, a modern wheat. It's quite uh, short, but it, is a, it has good winter hardiness and a very consistent yield. So for our area, for a modern wheat, this might be something to consider. Its baking characteristics perhaps are not as good as some of the other uh, varieties, but it's a good workhorse in the field. Now this is a older Pennsylvania heritage variety we have in the trial. Yeah, I like full caster. And in, in another year, we had a, a droughty spring. Full caster is the tallest wheat in our trials. And so normally it would be coming up to about here on me, but you can still see it's a, it's a tall heritage wheat. This one was bred just over the uh, Pennsylvania line in Maryland in the last quarter of the 19th century. And it comes from Fultz. It went, that's one of its parents, which was a very, very old heritage wheat on the eastern seaboard. It has a characteristic, it's, it's called, classified as a soft red, but what we've discovered is that these heritage soft wheats are really semi-hard. Now, what do I mean by that? When I talked about the soft and the hard before, I was talking about protein content, and typically we, the soft wheats have lower protein content and therefore aren't quite as good as uh, for baking bread. But it turns out that these older soft wheats actually have much higher protein content than the modern soft wheats. So for example, full caster can easily have 11 to 12% protein, which actually puts it into the bread category. We've actually tried making bread with full caster in our baking trials. And although it didn't, it didn't do as well as the hard red spring wheat varieties that we used, it still had interesting flavor and you can make bread with it. Good. So this is one of my favorite modern wheats. Um, it grows very well all over the Northeast. It's a Canadian wheat, um, and the Can it, we can only get it through Canada. Um, it has a very funny name, but it's, it's a very high quality baking bread wheat. Um, it's a hard red winter wheat. Again, like Arapaho, one of the things I like about it is it has consistent good yields. Um, it won't let you down. If anything's going to grow, warthog is going to grow and produce. In terms of baking quality, bakers really like it. In, in one test in New York City, for example, it got best in show among all the, all the wheats. And one of the things about it is it has a tendency to resist sprouting in the head. So that really helps uh, to keep its quality high. Now the one downside, there, no wheat is ever perfect, unfortunately. The one downside to warthog, it's a hard red winter wheat but its protein is, is usually somewhere between 10.5 and 11.5%. Especially artisan bakers seem to be able to work with that. So here we have another wheat, uh, Frederick. I know this is one of your favorites too, Elizabeth. Yeah, this is actually the go-to wheat uh, for organic growers in the Northeast for a soft white wheat. That's one of the classes that we talked about. And so it produces lovely white kernels. It is a soft wheat, it's modern. 
It was developed in the 1960s at Guelph University in Ontario. Uh, and it just, a lot of bakers love this wheat. They like to make the traditional things you make with soft white wheat, for example, pastries and so forth. But there are even some bakers, very famous bakers, who will use this and make bread with it. And we have actually included it in a bread trial and it has some nice characteristics, but of course, it's not a hard wheat. Its protein content is gonna be 10% or less, accent on the less. So uh, most people, most bakers would work with it as a, a soft wheat. So this is a popular heritage variety. This is probably the most famous North American heritage wheat variety, um, Red Fife. And it, uh, it has a very interesting history. It was first grown in Ontario by a farmer named David Fife. Grown as a hard red spring wheat, it has a very high protein content. It's, uh, for the time, it was excellent agronomically, uh, produced a good yield. Um, and its baking and milling qualities are superb. They still are very high. In our taste tests, we do get some indication that red fife tastes different from other wheat varieties. So, uh, for example, in one of our tests, it had a very earthy flavor. So it's, um, it was inducted into the Canadian uh, Slow Movement's Arc of Taste as a wonderful variety, and I think it, I think it is a wonderful variety. What you, there are two things about it to keep in mind. One is quite exciting. It's what we call a facultative wheat, meaning that it can be grown in the spring or the fall. This is very unusual. But when I say it can be grown in the spring or the fall, it can always be grown in the spring. But if you're in a very cold area, you're going to have trouble, you could potentially have trouble overwintering it in the fall. So, for example, in Pennsylvania, especially Lancaster County and so forth, not much trouble, pretty good winter survival. Northern New York, iffier, and you have had trouble with it. That's in terms correct, of, yeah. So this is a winter plot. Um, and the other, the other thing to keep in mind with Red Fife is that it's going to have a lower yield than modern wheat. It can have easily a, a 30, 33, even 50% yield reduction in comparison to a modern wheat. The only thing is that this, this wheat is in demand by consumers and bakers. So even though it doesn't yield as well, if you can produce a high quality product, it may be something you want to think about. We should point out was that my plot has some contamination. These bearded lines are not red fife. That's right. And I yeah. know I know our colleague Mark Sorrels at Cornell's got a project uh, underway to, to uh, purify the red fife and try to get back to the original uh, red fife germplasm as best as he can. That's right. In fact, we just planted out the so-called improved red fife, red fife, what you're talking about on a couple of farms this year to see how it's gonna do as a spring wheat. Now at the end of the season, we need to think about a few management tactics to get the best quality grain. One of them is a harvest timing. When the crop is ready and reaches that 15% moisture range or so, then it's time to think about uh, uh, getting it in the bin. And that can help us in several ways. It reduces the amount of uh, uh, fungus in the crop. It uh, helps with our test weight and improves the falling number all of which are important to the millers that are going to be uh, using the crop. Elizabeth, do you want to tell us a little bit about the, the uh, management after? So for the value-added grain market, it's very important that after the crop is harvested, you pay a lot of attention to cleaning and storing wheat properly because uh, it's great, as, as uh, Greg has pointed out, timely harvest is so important, but after that, you have to make sure that you clean out any contaminants from the grain and the best way to do that is to use one or more types of seed cleaners. Fortunately, the most common seed cleaners, air, air screen cleaners are pretty widely available at, at low cost used. So you can, you can clean your wheat fairly cheaply, but you also have to make sure that you get it down to 13% um, or less moisture if you're going to store it for any period of time and that you have a plan for storing it safely until it's ready to, to be sold. At some point, it's also important to do a vomitoxin test to make sure our grain is, has really low levels of vomitoxin. Exactly right, because we're talking about uh, grain that's gonna be eaten by people. And there are very strict standards uh, for vomitoxin, one part per million or less of the finished product. So most buyers 
especially millers and bakers who are clued into this kind of thing, they'll expect to see a test to make sure that your, your crop is, is acceptable in terms of its uh, quality. So hopefully this gives you a little idea of the uh, things that go into uh, producing organic value-added uh, wheat in our region and we'd be happy to work with folks who are interested in pursuing value-added varieties of winter wheat.